Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Metro Board activities of November 17th. To start the day off, I'll ask our Chief Safety Officer, Teresa Emposado, to provide us with our safety contact. Teresa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to Metro Headquarters. We don't have any drills planned today, but the, in the event of an alarm, we're going to exit through the doors, uh, gather in the hallway, and follow the instructions of the security staff. In the event of a medical emergency, there's an AED located right out in the hallway. I will fetch the AED. Restrooms are also located out in the hallway. During the winter, the DC area is subject to various safety hazards in the form of rain, sleet, snow, and ice. With the recent temperature drops, safety concerns can and do arise for employees and customers. Here are some tips for safely navigating the system during the winter. Plan extra time in your trip as inclement weather may disrupt transit. When navigating through rail stations, escalators, platforms, and buses, watch your step, do not rush, and pay attention to weather conditions and any wet floor signs and facilities. Use extra caution when walking on exposed surfaces, including parking lots, station platforms, and bus stops. Never run for a bus or train. If you're traveling with children, hold their hand. Report any unsafe conditions or concerns to a Metro employee, including station managers or bus operators. Stay informed during winter weather events with Metro Alerts. For additional information, see the severe weather section of the Rider Guide at WMATA.com. This concludes our safety contact. Thank you, Ms. Emposado, and welcome to the meeting of Metro Board's Executive Committee. Since this is our first public meeting of the day, I'll ask our Board Corporate Secretary to call the roll, Ms. Ellison. Chair Smedberg? Present. Vice Chair Babers? Present. Vice Chair Ports? I'm back to enter. Director Klein? Present. Director Letourneau? Director Lowe? Present. Director Drummer? Present. Director Martin Proctor? I'm going to call the roll again for those joining online. Vice Chair Ports? Director Letourneau? Okay. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as presented. Does anyone have any objections by a committee member? Hearing none, uh, the agenda is approved. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. We have the minutes of our September 22nd, 2022 meeting and the executive sessions of September 22nd, November 13th, and November 3rd of 2022 uh, before us for approval. Are there any objections or corrections to those sets of minutes as presented? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved as presented. We just, we have one item on our agenda this morning to accept a report from the inspector general authorizing it and, and, and authorizing its posting online. Acceptance of the OIG report. Under the board's bylaws, the executive committee is responsible for reviewing and accepting the reports of the inspector general. The committee has reviewed the following report. Management assistance report, WMATA crane purchase, MR 130001. Before we take the vote, I'd like to ask our Inspector General, Mr. Febles, uh, to provide the committee with any highlights from this report. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Directors. As you stated, um, I'm here to present the Management Assistance Report on the purchase of the crane. OIG received an allegation indicating that WMATA used federal funds to procure and purchase a $3.8 million 35-ton crane that did not perform as intended. We did investigate it, and we, in fact, um, did show that the crane was purchased and that it did not perform as intended. So for, for just a little clarity, um, so the, the procurement for the crane went out in 2009. It was, a, it was awarded in 2010 to Crane Masters and delivered in 2013. Um, at that time, the current safety protocols were not in place that are in place today, and we think that had they been, um, this would have been uh, discovered and dealt with at the time. Um, when it was delivered in 2013, personnel identified 59 workmanship and quality issues that plagued um, the crane uh, throughout its uh, uh, existence here at WMATA. Um, OIG made two recommendations. The first one that WMATA 
follow safety protocols regarding the equipment. And the second was to make a determination if the crane can be utilized or disposed. WMATA accepted both recommendations um, and we're working with them as, as well as um, Liz Sullivan's team. Um, to date, it has been secured and is not in use. Uh, the keys have been removed and there's a sign on the crane that says danger do not use. That is uh, my report. If there are any other questions, uh, gladly take them. Oh, Liz, you wanna say yeah. Liz, do you have anything you'd like to? Yes, Mr. Chair, I just would like to add that um, since that report, um, my organization, as you know, on behalf of the general manager, we follow up on items such as this. One of the things we were able to confirm is that since uh, February 2nd, 2022, a new SOP has been developed, SOP 202-20, for class two rail vehicles acceptance procedures. That uh, Those set of procedures cover the um, project initiation, project design, and acceptance and testing. So it also encourages and requires actually coordination across rail organizations, such as uh, the civil engineers, structural engineers, equipment, uh, equipment maintenance, track and structure as part of the uh, coordination effort, as well as expectations to work with safety to go through uh, the safety and certification program plan requirements for vehicles such as this prior to placing it into service. Thank you, Liz. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Any questions or comments from other board members? Okay. Thank you both, appreciate that update. Um, acceptance of this report constitutes the board's authorization to post it on the Inspector General's website, provided that the IG has conferred with the General Counsel and confirmed that any private or confidential information has been removed and or redacted in accordance with the applicable law and WMATA policy. I would like to move approval of this item. Is there a second from a committee member? Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Babers. Now I'll ask Ms. Ellison to please call the vote. Elections. Chair Smithberg. Aye. Vice Chair Babers. Aye. Vice Chair Ports. Aye. Ms. Klein. Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellison. Uh, thank you. The report has been accepted and the Inspector General has been authorized to post it online. That completes our business uh, for the Executive Committee today. We will now stand adjourned. I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Drummer uh, to begin the Safety and Operations Committee meeting. But before we do that, I believe uh, Secretary Ports, I obviously just heard you, so you're here at the meeting. Uh, Mr. Letourneau, are you also online? <laughs> yeah, we were here, but it was muted, yeah, so we okay. couldn't hear. Got it. We got it. We got it now. All right. Just wanted to make sure. All right. Uh, Mr. Thank Drummer. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think there was a little problem with the uh, audio at first, so that's why I didn't hear the roll call, so didn't respond. But I, I did send a, a note to John that I was present. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Operations Committee. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. Are there any objections to the agenda by members of the committee? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Now to approval of the minutes from our November 3rd meeting. Are there any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Uh, we have one item on the agenda this morning, an update from our chief safety officer on the Metro's roadway worker protection program. I'll turn the floor over to Ms. Impostato. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, while the slides load, I'll give a quick background on roadway worker protection. Roadway worker protection is a series of administrative controls that protect employees that are performing work along the track system from the hazards of being struck by moving trains or maintenance equipment. Earlier this year, I briefed the board on our multi-year plan to improve worker safety by enhancing our roadway worker protection program. And the presentation that I'm about to review will provide an update. I, earlier this year, we conducted some benchmarking with peer transit agencies and performed a gap analysis relative to uh, relevant federal requirements in the railroad industry. Uh, the rail industry has regulatory requirements pertaining to roadway worker protection um, in 49 CFR part 214. 
the transit industry does not currently have prescriptive regulatory requirements pertaining to roadway worker protection programs. However, the FTA has advised transit agencies to review the FRA programs for applicability and use in best practices. Metro performed a holistic review of our practices to identify high risk mitigations and to improve our overall program. After an exhaustive data analysis as part of our safety management system in 2021, uh, Metro embarked on a new program of oversight that was data driven and focused on a number of items that had been historically overlooked. Uh, safety staff are now performing both announced and unannounced reviews of roadway worker protection practices and are performing direct observation of the execution of extended work practices in contrast with prior spot observation programs. In terms of data tracking and performance trending, in 2022, you'll see reflected in the chart an increase in roadway worker protection incidents. Uh, the good news there is that those incidents were discovered proactively through increased safety compliance inspection, which enabled the safety team to work directly with the individuals that were at risk performing the work to intervene and correct the conditions on site rather than discover them after the fact. Additionally, we're performing more in-depth data analysis, uh, looking at a historical trend. WMATA has processes that are unique to our system, specifically the advanced mobile flagger and work zone setup processes at WMATA are atypical for the rail transit industry. These atypical practices associated um, with the advanced mobile flagger and work zone setup do present challenges in execution. And in our benchmarking efforts with peer agencies, uh, we discovered that we have some opportunities to refine our efforts and provide an advanced level of safety for our employees by simplifying our processes. These efforts are now underway. Um, as you can see, year over year, many of the incident types remain steady um, or increased with the exception of work zone setups. Uh, that was a target of the new inspection program in 2022. And we believe that the data proves out both process changes as well as increased targeted interventionary activities by management and operations and the safety team working together have reduced any type of incidents associated with that. We've also begun tracking an additional category discovered on site through the execution of work with regard to ongoing work practices relative to hand signals, horn operation, and at work communication. We'll be tracking that longitudinally in future years to identify opportunities for enhanced communications, work process guidelines, as well as to feed our training efforts. In 2022, uh, we've taken a lot of work underway. Uh, we improved documentation to allow for a comprehensive review of protection practices between our rail operations control center and the workers that they are protecting in the field. We've assessed the current state versus the railroad industry best practices and identified a number of easily implementable improvements that have been made. This includes establishing a new exclusive track occupancy and foul time process that presents documented ability and traceability for long-term auditing purposes. We've redesigned our job aids and roadway job safety briefing forms and established a formal process for managing multiple work groups working within an outage. Uh, we've performed training on the new processes and continue to assess the efficacy of those processes. Moving forward, uh, next we will commence a review by a panel of industry experts of the RWP enhancements that we've implemented to date, as well as our path forward. We're also going to have uh, multiple procurement efforts underway to overhaul the RWP training program with a focus on adult learning, um, as well as the practical application of those administrative procedures. We're also formalizing additional programmatic elements and exploring opportunities to augment the administrative practices with novel and emergent technology. 
All of that will take place over the coming three to six months. Long term, uh, we'll be implementing an enhanced roadway worker protection training program um, as part of our overall efforts to improve our training. And we'll be implementing new safety standards and incorporating uh, the aforementioned novel technologies to further mitigate roadway worker protection risks. All of these actions are included as part of our fiscal year 2024 uh, safety roadmap as part of implementing our safety management systems. Mr. Chair, that concludes our update on Metro's Roadway Worker Protection Program, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Before receiving comments and questions from our um, committee members and other board members, I'll make one comment and one recommendation. Uh, my first comment is there are a lot of moving parts, both human-centric and technology in this process, and I want to say big kudos for going after this. This is huge uh, because it could be catastrophic if we don't get it right. I want to say big kudos to you again uh, for the increased safety compliance inspections. Uh, that didn't go past us. I mean, and that's important, being proactive in the arena. And then I'll close with, uh, with this comment uh, as far as my initial comments. I hope we develop a simplistic, holistic process that's not overbearing for folks to understand as we plan, as we conduct site assessments, and as we have on-site application. Uh, with all of these moving parts, it's real easy to get complicated, and folks won't execute well if it's too complicated. So I hope we have that. Absolutely, and that was part of our findings, where that we had a degree of complication and redundancy that had progressed beyond the point of uh, benefit and was actually a diminishing return. So we're seeking to simplify and make more understandable, more rapidly applicable the Roadway Worker Protection Administrative Controls. Thank you. Comments from committee members? Hello? Um, I'll second what Director Drummer said. I, I just want to commend you for how much work has been done on this since the last board presentation on Roadway Worker Protection. I. This really just came to my attention. I mean, sort of shortly after I joined the board, I was reading the minutes of some WMSC meetings, and it just seemed like there was a lot of stuff in there about roadway worker protection incidents. And so I, I think I sent you an email like in February, being like, I don't know what this is. Like, can we have a presentation on this? I am so impressed with how much work has been done since February. I cannot imagine how all this got done at the same time as everything else that's going on. Um, the thing I like the best is, I think it's, it's almost always a problem when I hear that WMATA is doing something different than the way that everybody else in the transit industry is doing it. There's, there, there, we, sh we need to get rid of WMATA exceptionalism and adopt industry best practices. So I love to hear that we're moving in that direction. I'm really intrigued by the possibility that streamlining how we get access to track could both improve safety in terms of what's been going on in terms of incidents, but also I wonder if it could potentially um, improve like how, I mean the reason we're trying to get this access is to do maintenance. A win for maintenance is also a win for safety. So I'm, in, I'm gonna be watching this. I'm really intrigued to see um, how this goes. Um, I'm excited that this is benchmarked against other agencies and is about developing a, a program that is really sustainable. But I also wanna hear more about, in, the, in perhaps in the next update, this is, this is not just about like a protocol change, but clearly a culture change, right, in how we're thinking about this and how we're doing it. So I'd love to hear um, from the workers involved in this, how they feel about it and what this means for the culture at, within this little piece of WMATA. Because I don't have a sense of that, and I think it's, it's important and I'm interested. Absolutely, I'd be happy to provide that detail. Um, I can also say that all of the enhancements to training and procedures that we've made 
have been reviewed by interdisciplinary working groups that include representation from our frontline workforce. And we do plan um, in the upcoming revisions to also vet that with our Joint Labor Management Safety Committee. Thank you, Dr. Law. Any comments from any other board members? Ms. Klein? Well, thank you, Chair Drummer. Um, I think actually I'll agree with the comments that have been made thus far. And I'm actually, one of my questions was going to be whether the Joint Labor Management Committee was going to be involved in the, in the uh, revision of the procedures going forward. I think that's a great use of that committee. I'm glad to hear that's going to happen. Um, I was struck by the numbers, as we all were, I think, um, of particularly of uh, the increase in incidents in 2022. But I, I'm saying that sort of as the numerator. I was wondering what the denominator was. Were we putting more folks out on the tracks doing more maintenance because we were running less service during that year? Or is the denominator consistent, if you know kind of what I'm asking, between the years that we're looking at? So we have had uh, some increases and decreases relative to the access to track as well as workforce availability. Um, for rate calculation purposes, we elected to normalize utilizing revenue vehicle miles because we thought that was the best reflection of the operation. Um, looking at the ability for uh, work groups to access the track, that did ebb and flow throughout the pandemic, um, both with scheduling challenges as well as workforce availability. In 2022, as we've worked to ramp up and restore our service, we have been accessing the track more frequently, so the denominator has also increased there. Okay, it's still an alarming number. Um, I don't mean to minimize that, but I just wanted to kind of put it in context a little bit, um, since our service has been a little different over the past year. Um, for the incidents that are not proactively identified by the upfront inspections, how do those come to your attention? Those incidents are usually reported by uh, self-reports for involved individuals. Um, that would include the roadway workers that are working on the tracks, if there's an issue with speed compliance as a train proceeds by, or an operator reporting uh, workers that have unauthorized access on the tracks. Uh, we've also been alerted to incidents by supervisors uh, in the operations department that are performing their regularly scheduled tasks. Um, and they're discovering them in real time through their observation processes. So I don't know if you know the and if you have an answer to this, but I'm also wondering whether the increase in the number could be an increase in the willingness of folks to self-report, uh, which could actually be ironically kind of a positive sign, even though the number is, I mean, illustrating the extent of the problem where maybe we didn't know it before. Absolutely. Uh, in the prior briefing to the board, we did actually break out a significant increase in self-reporting. Um, we're very pleased to see that employees are more willing to admit uh, errors and oversights mm -hmm. on their part, uh, report them and correct them. As part of our SMS and improving voluntary safety reporting programs, we're going to have some dedicated activities um, in the coming year, working specifically with our maintenance forces to encourage them to utilize our close call program to report any of these types of errors or omissions um, and to incent them to do so in a largely consequence free environment as part of our just culture. Very good. Um, obviously, I didn't commit the past briefing to memory the way Dr. Lowe has. <laughs> um, my last question is, uh, I was wondering about the training protocols. Uh, it, you did do a September to November additional training. Was that for all roadway workers? That Did they go through that process at that time? It was. Uh, so the new exclusive track occupancy and foul time standard operating procedures, as well as the joint occupancy form and the redesigned job safety briefing form, were all part of that uh, training package that was put out uh, in advance of opening the silver line as well. So we included some additional updates for the new territories that folks would be maintaining. And so is there, is there a regular cadence for training for uh, roadway workers? I know we've learned that there, there are for rail operators, bus operators, others. What kind of cadence is there here? There is an annual requirement uh, for recertification for roadway workers. Um, during the pandemic, we did make that uh, a CBT option for folks. Now we've returned to in-person uh, recertification on an annualized basis. 
and we're basic and we're up to date. On yes. That. Great. <laughs> Those are all my questions. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I, this is such an important issue. I mean, this has been a challenge at WMATA for many years, and I think this is a really positive uh, set of goals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Randy? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I just want to make a quick comment. I, I so much appreciate what the board members are leaning into here because um, I think it really allows, empowers the staff to, I think, where we really need to go, which is, in a lot of ways, simpler is safer. We've created, uh, you know, being here a little over, a little over 100 days, I've noticed we have, a, again, I've said it a lot of times, we have an incredibly talented workforce, and, uh, you know, I think Brian has said this well, being our new COO, always out there trying to do the right thing. In many ways, I think we've done um, some way a disservice to our staff over periods of time. We're a little bit like the tax code. So instead of solving something, we've added more pages to the, the, the code. And now in some areas, we've over, we made something that in, in across the industry, you know, board member Lowe, you're saying we, we need to be like the industry and then the best part of our industry. And the industry is not just the US, right? Like I have a fair amount of experience, uh, fortunately for me, in international. I know some other members of our team. If, if, you know, I'll make something up. If Berlin does something the best, we need to look at that and replicate it. If Chicago does that the best, we will do that. We need to kind of ground ourselves that this industry happens all over the world and it does it well. And we do a lot of things well. And so we're going to be using more and more of the APTA process. We had one APTA peer review in and we'll be reporting back on that. Uh, Brian has another one. He's lining up with Teresa as well. But simple in a lot of ways, we want to empower our staff to do the right thing out there. And if you make a procedure overly complicated, it's not only going to find issues, it's going to naturally find issues because it's too hard to actually follow. And then that causes other complications. So we are gonna do that. Second, we have to invest in the right technology to help our workforce. Technology isn't to supplement our workforce, it is actually to be additive to our workforce. And we are the only transit rail property in the world that has regressed from the technology we started with to where we are. So we ran on an ATO system, which is the way every major safe rail system in the world operates, and we don't operate on that now. It is much safer to run an ATO than it is the way we do manual today, and so the team is working on that, and we'll have to go, th we're working through that process. Another example would be automatic doors. Clearly that is a safer operation than what we have today. So today we mitigate all these things with human procedures, and then we're putting a lot of burden on each individual employee to be basically perfect, while instead we're eliminating the technology to help them do their job. So this is this mindset we want to bring forward. How do we make our staff excel at their jobs to have this just culture by using A, technology, and B, simplifying their training and development? In some ways, getting up past training, too, to be about mentoring and coaching and again, I've been at town halls, Brian Teresa said this. If you make a mistake, put up your hand. We're gonna have your back. We gotta learn and grow, continuous improvement. I've been leaning into that publicly. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna own that mistake. That's how we get better. And I think, uh, you know, this Rome wasn't built in a day, wasn't destroyed in a day. Uh, we have work to do, but I think the work Brian and Teresa and the team are leading, I just want to say thank you to the board for backing them because this, this is that cultural shift that will make a big difference long term. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. Dr. Lowe? Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in and say this is easy to back because I see how much progress has been made since February, even with a lot of other stuff going on at the same time. So, you know, I just, I just want to be clear that just from an outside perspective, this is headed in the right direction and I really like what I'm hearing. Um, I'm... I'm intrigued by what you have to say, Randy. I, I mean, I'm eager for talking about ATO to be on the agenda. I want to look forward and see that on the horizon. Um, I mean, y'all need to let us know, you know, when it's time and we can get into that. But I'm extremely eager for that to be on the agenda somewhere in the future. I, I'd like to know that it's within my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the team, Brian and Teresa and others will be back in December talking about where we are with ATO and automatic doors. Uh, oh, gee, actually, I guess it is. <laughs> we meet a lot, don't we? <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for our presentation and getting us engaged in this process. Uh, with no further business to come before the committee, we will stand adjourned. And I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Letourneau for today's Finance and Capital Committee meeting.
Thank you, Mr. Drummer. Um, just getting my sheet up here. Bear with me for a second. Okay. So our Finance and Capital Committee meeting of November 17th. Thank you for joining us. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as presented. Are there any objections by members of the committee? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved. Uh, sorry, uh, the agenda approved. Next, on to approval of the minutes. We have the minutes of our October 27th meeting. Any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved. So today, instead of our 24 budget discussion, um, we're actually going to take a little bit of a backwards look into our performance during the current fiscal year so far. So this is an update on the first quarter of 2023, which ended on September 30 for the operating and the capital budgets. I'll turn the floor over our uh, over to our interim CFO to review the operating budget performance. Yutende. Good morning, Mr. Letourneau and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Yetunde Olumide. I'm the interim chief financial officer and executive vice president. This morning, I'll share the FY23 first quarter um, operating financial results to include um, ridership revenue and operating expense. Through Q1 of FY23, Metro has a net profitable um, favorable position of $48 million. This favorability is mostly due to expenses coming in $56 million, lower than budget, offset by unfavorable revenues of $8 million. Expense favorability is largely driven by vacancies, lower than expected metro access trips, reduced contracted services, and materials and supplies usage. Offsetting the expense favorability is revenue, which was under budget by $8 million, primarily due to lower than expected Metro Rail ridership, which continues to recover at a slower pace than budget, while bus ridership is outpacing budget. Metro is engaging in customer facing initiatives and other contractual obligations, which enhance our riders experience through Q4. Taken together, ongoing expenses will offset the favorability seen in Q1. This slide shows on the left side total expenses at $515 million and revenues at $86 million, excluding federal relief drawn of $131 million. The right side of this page illustrates the $131 million federal relief drawn, $48 million less than expected due to the aforementioned favorability in expense offset by the revenue losses. This Q1 FY23 operating summary PL shows Q1 budget and actuals compared to the same period pre-pandemic. Although we are favorable by $48 million, revenues are less than half of pre-pandemic levels, while expenses have grown by 14% compared to the first quarter of FY19. Total revenues were $193 million pre-pandemic, compared now to just $86 million in the first quarter. The cost increase between FY19 and FY23 is mostly related to contractual wage agreements. Offsetting the revenue losses and increased expenses is federal relief of $131 million and jurisdictional subsidies. I'll pivot quickly to ridership and revenues in Q1. The table on the left shows ridership by mode. Rail and bus continue to show strong year-over-year -year growth of 43% and 32% respectively. However, compared to budget, rail is down 6.4% while
while BUS shows a strong performance, being 29% over budget at the end of the quarter. Total ridership during Q1 across all modes was 45 million trips, exceeding budget by 10%. Rail ridership is expected to improve in Q2 and beyond thanks to increasing rail car availability, improved frequency, the reopening of stations, and the Q1 due to Potomac Yard cordova work. And of course, the Silver Line opening just a few days ago. Over three years, total ridership has grown from 17 to 33, and now to 45 million trips in the first quarter, good news. Okay. Through Q1, bus has 25 million or 55% of the total trips while rail lagged behind with about 44%. Even though Metro Rail ridership only accounted for 44% of all ridership, it made up 77% of total passenger revenues. As noted previously, Metro Rail is improving and is expected to continue due to the rail car availability and improved frequencies. This slide compares pre-pandemic non-passenger revenues to Q1 of FY23. Through Q1, Non-passenger revenues totaled $17.4 million, 1.6 million or 8% below budget. With the exception of parking, which is closely tied to rail ridership, other non-passenger revenue categories have recovered to or near their pre-pandemic levels. I'll pivot now to operating expenses. Through Q1, expenses were favorable by about 56 million previously mentioned. Personal expenses are favorable by about 18.5 million, primarily due to vacancy savings um, offset by some overtime expenses. The overall operating agency vacancy rate is about 11% and 1,400 FTEs. Non-personnel expenses are favorable by $37 million, primarily due to savings in lower traditional ridership in paratransit services, reductions in some contracted services, and materials and parts usage. We've also had some savings in the propulsion um, category uh, due to the 7K returning back and the Silver Line reopening um, commencement. talk about a few things we're doing on the customer experience side. The slide shows some of the initiatives um, that are underway tied to improving customer experience. Uh, they include, of course, the bus and rail frequency improvements, um, hiring more bus operators and retention, and also hiring customer service liaisons across the entire authority. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. So uh, before we open it up, just, just to be really clear on exactly what the situation is and then kind of summarize, we are um, a little bit below what we were projecting um, in terms of rail ridership at this point, correct? That's correct. And where are we on bus? Bus is favorable compared to what we had um, originally projected in the budget. So we have a bl we had a blended um, pre-pandemic ridership percentage number. That's an awkward way to phrase that. Uh, I think it was fifty-two or fifty-three percent. That was fifty-three percent at the end of the year. At this time, yeah. at the end of Q1, we're at fifty-six percent, largely due to the bus ridership uh, coming That's in good. over seventy percent. Right. But because it's bus ridership coming in over from a revenue standpoint, we're still under. Correct. Okay. Um, let me open it up to others for questions. I Ms. can't Klein? see very. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thank you. 
just had one question, and it relates to something that was in the accompanying memo um, rather than the slides. There was a reference in the context of um, the federal relief funds of which we are coming in because of the um, being favorable towards budget coming in under uh, what we were expecting to have expended, I think, at this point, um, that referred to a jurisdictional credit. Can you explain what that means, please? Sure. Um, thank you for your question, Ms. Klein. Uh, the jurisdictional credit is the share of the ARPA um, allocations that is a payback to the jurisdictions. So this is not a warm out of funding. This was administered by Metro, but is actually jurisdictional um, funding from ARPA. I thought ARPA funding came to Metro as transit funding. Yes, it did come to Metro as transit funding. That portion that you're referring to is not included in Metro's budget. It's the jurisdictional um, allocation from ARPA to the jurisdictions and uh, passing, passing through um, um, or we're administering the transfer of those funds. I guess I'm not, I'm not tracking this exactly. There, ARPA had separate pots of funding for transit and for state and local governments. Are you saying that WMATA received a portion that was directed for state and local governments and are passing it through? No, ma'am. Um, we're, we're merely administering, um, being the, the vehicle to administer those funds um, from the allocation from the FTA, uh, from the federal government to those um, participating jurisdictions. For their transit service? Or for whatever purpose they? For whatever purpose. Yeah, I can't speak to their purpose specifically. So this, I guess this is a question probably we'll need to follow up on um, in a little more detail because it, the goal of the ARPA transit program was to provide relief for transit agencies, um, not for state I'll jump, local I'll, government. Yes, yeah, yeah, Sarah, Sarah, I can, and we can have some, there was a lot of discussion on the board at the time over this because we, the board had to vote on these allocations. So um, we can, we can certainly connect, but the, the, Ultimately, what happened was the, the jurisdictions received release from WMATA on their subsidy, and that's kind of how it was administered. Um, but it, it was the jurisdictions had their own transit service, so effectively it was money that kept those systems running as well. Okay, well, um, what I'm seeing now in 2022 is that we are facing a big budget gap next year. We have federal funds that could be used to help with that because I don't believe these funds have an expiration date in terms of their expenditure. No. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting maybe the board could, could think about this and, and perhaps think about whether the situation is different now than it was in the time when the board previously considered it. Um, well, I didn't, I thought that was a one-time situation, you tend to. It was a one-time um, situation yeah. with the ARPA, correct? So we're not we're not we're not going to continue to provide any discounts or subsidy or anything for the for the jurisdictions, right? I don't plan on it, sir. No. So I think. So, uh, so what's the jurisdictional credit then that was referred to in the memo? It was exactly as um, just previously described is the is the ARPA credit, um, but that was a one-time in and. So one time meaning applying to all ARPA funds? I thought it meant one time as in applying to FY21. FY23. Right. All right. Let, I think I've made my point. I think the board needs to reconsider um, how we're dealing with any more favorable um, budget uh, results well, with regard to the federal funds. But I think the point was we already made the credit. We've already done it. The only, the only thing we could do now is to try to claw it back, which... I don't think we can do. We can't undo that now. We're not I, going to do I, it again. I, I, need, in the I guess I need to see this mapped out. So perhaps okay. I'll just ask for a follow-up where we yeah, can yeah. see the federal funding that has come in and then the credit and when that decision was made, then I can look back. Certainly. Understand it. Okay. And it, so it applies to all the ARPA funds. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Mr. Spedberg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you tend to have a question, uh, your slide where you 
have ridership and passenger revenue highlighted. Um, you know, the ridership for rail is slightly below. We've got, you know, the yellow line is still closed for, you know, several more months now. We've got other, you know, the federal government still hasn't made any kind of final determination as to when people are or aren't coming back. Um, so we have some challenges there, but uh, what are the trends? I think we got to look at, you know, we're under, but, you know, you know, what are the trends in ridership? I think that's what we really, you know, have to look at here. And, and now with the, the Silver Line Phase 2 open, you know, where, where do you see that trend heading um, as we lead into, you know, budget season? Thank you for that question, um, Chairman. Uh, definitely we are uh, looking at a positive trend um, at the end of Q3. We are at 56% of our pre-COVID ridership, um, where we had budgeted 53%. So it's, it's looking good from that perspective. Of course, BUS is leading that, I want to say that effort, um, uh, up to 56%. July came in at 52%, um, August at 55%, September at 60%. And the preliminary October numbers are coming in right about 57. Those are preliminary numbers for October at this time. So um, given the, 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 the coming back uh, with the 7K series rail cars and all the customer engagement um, and different activities we're engaging in across uh, the authority, the expectation that is that we will see that increased ridership as we continue through the months. And the passenger revenue side really does highlight, I know this is always the back and forth and debate we have, but the importance of rail to being, you know, providing the dollars to do these other types of programs. Uh, you know, and I don't think even in this situation where things are slowly, it still highlights the fact that rail is important here, uh, you know, to the financial stability of the, of the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Mrs. Smetberg, yes. Chair, I, I, I just want to add a point on ridership. So uh, we are definitely trending on the rail side. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays are clearly uh, the higher days, and we're seeing that nationally as well. But I'll tell you, we hit uh, just over 305,000 yesterday. So that's four Wednesdays in a row. We've been over the 300,000 mark on rail. Um, I think we had... Uh, there was a big military uh, conference on the 12th of October that was actually our highest day since the start of the, you know, when the pandemic started, or pre-pandemic, and yesterday was the second highest day. So outside of that big event on the 12th, yesterday would have been the highest day. Uh, there's a reporter in the room that actually put a, a, a video and a, a picture of today showing very packed uh, trains. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's clear if you're out in the system, ridership is, is definitely coming back. and. Um, I, I will say, I think a lot of it's also to do with our frequency. We, we are running a lot more frequent service, and I'll give kudos to Brian and the operations team. Yesterday, we had 29 um, 7K train sets out on the system, the highest amount we've had now in over a year. And so I think as we bring free, safe frequency back, uh, we're going to then allow people to know how dependable we really are to get them around. So all signs are going in the right direction. And I just I, you know, want, want to repeat to everyone, we are working real hard every day to provide that capacity to deliver uh, space for more people because uh, <laughs> they kind of go hand in hand, right, uh, how it works. So re really just proud of the team, how, the, how hard they're working. But I want to give that update. Uh, you know, really good news yesterday. I, I watch it every day. And so uh, when I went to bed last night, there were over 300,000. It was another good, uh, I felt good. That we're, we're no, it, I mean, it's great. And I, and I think that's important as we go into this budget season, if you will, to understand those trends, what it will mean to the organization. Absolutely. Yeah, especially on the revenue side. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments from members of the board? Yeah, Matt, I know you can't see me, so I'm just going to oh, yeah, verbalize go that I have some questions. Great. Go ahead. So this quarterly report is so interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, concur with what Chair Smedberg said, which is, you know, like in the big picture, the question is, do we need to worry about ridership recovery relative to the FY24 budget? Um, I, yeah, out in the system, it's clear like things are very much in flux in terms of like 
every day the service is a little bit better. And it's something you can feel in real time. So it's just something to keep an eye on. You know, Randy, we're waiting for, you know, like semaphore or something. Just like let us know if, if we need to start getting worried about hitting FY24 budget wise. Um, I will say um, I had my fastest trip ever since joining the WMATA board from my home to headquarters this morning. It was fantastic. I, I really, I was, I was running late, and so I, and so I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, turning to my questions, um, I want to talk about OPEX because I feel like something that I, I've previously picked up or I feel like I've been told kind of directly is that our OPEX is mostly labor, it's mostly fixed, but I, I'm, I feel like a, there's a, like a vibe in this presentation that maybe that's not the case. I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, and so I, I need some help like walking through the numbers and understanding how much, like, how big the non-personnel operating savings really are and how to unpack them. So slide 14, the overall operating savings in a single quarter was 56 million. Did I read that correctly? Yes, a board member Lou, you did. I mean, that is a lot to find under a couch cushion in a single quarter. So, you know, I'm just looking ahead to FY24 and thinking like, ooh, like, are we on to something here? Or is, I, so, uh, so then jumping ahead to slide 21, um, that's, that's where I want to start understanding what we, where this OPEX positive variance came from. Um, slide 21, if we, if we can. I, I just need a, I need a little bit more help understanding what I'm seeing on this slide. So on the, obviously the bulk of the savings are on the personnel side. And so this is consistent with what we've been told previously about like, look, operating is the cost are driven by labor. And, um, but this, the fact that there was um, significant um, vacancy savings, some of these vacancies we desperately need to fill, right, bus drivers, et cetera. But like, um, Randy, are you taking, you're t I feel like I've heard you allude multiple times to like taking a big picture look at the org chart. Are we going to uncover some long-term vacancy savings or are you pretty much just reallocating and you need bodies? Uh, well, I would. I would say both, it would be the best way to describe that. So in uh, the last budget update on FY24, we, we showed a $10 million marker, and that is vacancies that we are now gonna eliminate as positions that uh, Dennis and Utendi worked hard and with the, the, the staff to do that. I, I still think that there's probably room for, uh, we'll say consolidation or optimization inside of the agency. Uh, you know, We're looking at the management team structure and then everything kinda goes through that process. Uh, with that said, we have big needs across the authority. So yes, you mentioned uh, bus operators, very, very high. We have police officers, we have signal maintainers, we have recruiters in HR. If you don't have recruiters, you can't actually hire bus operators. We have procurement. We are an incredibly competitive space for anything to do with technology and IT, being the national capital and all the, all the IT sector around here. So uh, I mean, we have needs across the authority, but that doesn't change the fact that um, we have to, you know, it's the public's money, and we have to, we have a very big, you know, I don't want to use the term fiscal kill cliff, but we have a fiscal challenge ahead that I think it's really important that we are showing the public that we are doing everything we can to optimize every public funded dollar before we then eventually have a larger conversation about the future funding of Metro. So, so we are doing both, because we also can't have that larger conversation if we don't have the operation working at its highest level, and we can't do that without all the staff that we need to do that. So. A little bit of both. Okay, so that I think that's exactly the right way to be thinking about it. And so I think that um, the board and the public, when it's the right time in the budget process, I think we need to see the org chart and how it's evolving. So I know that that's not gonna fit on a slide. <laughs> um, but I think I, I'd like to see the just like the pre-Randy org chart and your envisioned FY24 org chart just so that I can start to wrap my head around it conceptually. I understand though that 10 million's, a, I can't, I'm, I'm not gonna retire on that 10 million. <laughs> I, 
I get that, that that's not, that's not gonna close our budget gap. Okay, um, so turning to non-personnel savings, right, and looking beyond the org chart, this is, I get that this isn't the bulk of the savings, but like, once again, you know, 137 million is nothing to like, you know, be like, oh, it's, it's not much. I, this, is, this is a lot of money. And so I, I wanna understand a little bit more what's driving the non-personnel savings. Like, what is the propulsion save? I'm, so my eye is drawn to that. It's like, it's not the biggest category here. Like, what is services and what is, what is, what is in services and what is in propulsion? Dr. Lowe, um, the, the, what the numbers you're seeing in front of you are the expenses through Q1. On the service side, we have various uh, contracted services across the authority from um, IT software to uh, different uh, uh, contracted cleaning or um, other services on the operation side, plant as well. Um, the paratransit service there, uh, favorability you see, is the delta between the budgeted rates, uh, the budgeted rides um, that uh, were in the initial plan and the rides that actually came through. On the propulsion fuel, we've talked about um, ramping up of the seven Ks and that we didn't have them uh, for the first quarter. Um, the savings you're seeing there is um, us not having all those vehicles running and therefore not spending as much on propulsion fuel. Oh, I see, okay. So, right, we're, we're and running as we fewer ramp trains, up. we're using less electricity. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That is, so that is not the, that's not the right kind of savings. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, thanks for helping me understand this. There aren't really any exciting implications for FY24. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, Jennifer, are there other? There are no additional questions. We can move to the next presentation. Okay, let's move on to the capital side then. And I think Tom is uh, leading this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board and committee. Um, uh, my name is Tom Webster, Strategy Planning Program Management at Metro, joined by my colleague Andy Off uh, with Capital Delivery. Um, we're pleased to be here this morning uh, to provide a quick uh, first quarter update on our capital improvement program progress. Um, so Metro's six-year capital program totals $12.4 billion uh, for investments in the replacement rehabilitation maintenance and modernization of the system's assets, so infrastructure, equipment, um, uh, and vehicles. The FY23 capital budget, um, the first year expenditure forecast uh, for the six-year program totals 2.5 billion. Uh, through the first quarter, the first three months of FY23, uh, we invested 582 million and are on track for the fiscal year uh, with a forecast of 2.5 billion on budget for, um, for FY23. On the uh, funding side, um, lots of good news here. And again, uh, thanks to the uh, Congressional Delega Delegation, Congress, the administration, and the um, bipartisan uh, infrastructure law, uh, Metro will receive this year uh, 448 million in federal formula grants and 148 and a half million in PREA funding. Um, and our grants have been, uh, th again, thanks to uh, the Federal Transit Administration, have been awarded and are in place and are being uh, drawn down on now uh, for reimbursements for capital projects and programs and maintenance activities. Um, our uh, jurisdictional regional contributions, uh, both the uh, dedicated funding and um, the uh, traditional uh, jurisdictional contributions to Metro's capital program, uh, are all committed and um, contributions have been made on schedule for the, through the first uh, four months of the year. And um, as the committee is aware, the uh, dedicated funding uh, bond issuance is uh, scheduled for uh, later this fiscal year. So overall, uh, very good news on track on the uh, overall capital budget for the uh, fiscal year and on track with funding in place 
uh, for the capital budget. Now I'll turn it over to uh, to Andy to step through some progress. Oh, thank you, Tom, uh, and good morning to the board. Um, Next slide. Uh, so as Tom noted, I'm just going to walk through a few of our projects, you know, just a good opportunity to reflect, uh, you know, on the great work that's happened over the summer and the fall. Uh, certainly we've talked about uh, Potomac Yard and the Yellow Line project, and we will touch on those uh, in a few slides here. Uh, we got through the summer shutdown, uh, you know, from, um, you know, Minnesota Deanwood out to New Carrollton, um, working, you know, solar panels out at uh, Anacostia. Um, uh, just this morning, uh, you know, out of Columbia Heights, uh, we opened up our second um, metro, the passenger information uh, that will be topside, you know, before customers, you know, go down into the station. Uh, what's shown here is our first rendition, you know, at Metro Center. Uh, historic bus renovation. Uh, this is a picture out at uh, Chevy Chase uh, bus loop. Um, you know, awesome historic project. You know, there's very significant uh, you know, to, to um, you know, the folks uh, who utilize that facility. Um, certainly our new escalators, which we've been, you know, getting after very aggressively uh, for about the past decade. Our bus shelter program, uh, which now, you know, we're kicking off and getting a lot of good momentum there. Uh, one of the amenities we're very focused there, um, you know, is e-paper, uh, where we intend to power that via solar where, uh, wherever possible. And then certainly uh, the one here probably needs a reminder in the bottom right, uh, we did successfully uh, open Silver Line Phase 2 on Tuesday. Um, you know, so those are kind of the bigger uh, muscle movements we have going, but certainly there is a lot uh, of very important things going on behind the scenes, uh, you know, to support our employees. Uh, lighting upgrades, you know, in our Metro bus garages. Uh, of course, the building we're sitting in uh, today uh, some of the upgrades we're doing in our maintenance uh, facilities and our shops, uh, some of our supply warehouses. Um, another historic bus uh, loop, this is Calvert Street, uh, so that's our second of third. Um, the top right picture is of our Carmen Turner facility, a uh, very important um, facility that supports the operation. Uh, and then break rooms, uh, you know, for our employees, which is uh, when you go out and talk to our frontline employees is probably the number one uh, piece of feedback on things, you know, we need to get after as a management team uh, to improve their quality of life. Tom? And um, as part of uh, Metro's Better Bus Initiative, um, we are ramping up our partnership with uh, departments of transportation in the region uh, to implement uh, roadway infrastructure and technology improvements uh, to improve bus speeds, uh, service reliability, and, and quality of service for customers. Um, we're partnering with uh, DOT's Departments of Transportation and uh, Highway Administrations across the region, Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. Um, as a recent example, um, we recently launched uh, efforts to plan and implement um, some tactical bus lanes in partnership with the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration Montgomery and Prince George's County DOTs um, on uh, Georgia Avenue in Silver Spring and uh, Silver Hill Road in Suitland. What tactical bus lanes are, um, there's an image of one uh, in within uh, the district in the middle of this slide. It's essentially uh, red paint on, on, the, uh, on the roadway um, to dedicate that bus lane. Um, and it's a faster implementation tactical approach uh, to speed up buses, um, hopefully in advance of more um, more uh, sophist, uh, um, excuse me, uh, um, uh, comprehensive infrastructure improvements to uh, dedicate those lanes to bus service. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we wanted to provide uh, the board and the public uh, with an update on two of our major projects. Uh, first, being the Yellow Line Bridge closure, as was mentioned, um, that was closed on the 10th of September. Uh, we are on schedule as of today. I think it's been you know, pretty, you've gotten some pretty good coverage and have had the opportunity to get the media down into, um, you know, the tunnel to take a look at the great work the team is doing down there. You know, as of today, uh, the primary work uh, we're doing is uh, sandblasting all the steel liner tunnel and welding in new plates and painting. Uh, you know, very complex operation, but uh, we are proud to say that we are on schedule uh, and do fully expect to uh, open uh, as scheduled uh, in early May. 
uh, Potomac Yard Station, huge milestone about two weeks ago where we successfully uh, tested out and put into uh, revenue service the new tracks. Um, Mr. Clark and uh, myself are working very closely uh, with the chairman and the city of Alexandria. And, you know, our intent uh, is to meet in early December uh, to work through the details of, uh, you know, an opening date uh, for that awesome facility. So we, we intend to, uh, you know, talk more publicly about that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and I'm sure we have heard about Northern Bladensburg. I just uh, wanted to cover a few things here. If you think about, you know, the past decade, uh, we have built, you know, new Greenfield or, you know, brand new bottom-up bus garage facilities at uh, Andrews uh, in Prince George's County and also Cinderbed in Fairfax County. Um, but what, what's so awesome about these two projects, uh, Northern and Bladensburg, uh, is that th these uh, have been significant needs uh, for decades. And, you know, um, you know, due to, you know, the dedicated funding, and I think just having some more organization uh, organizational wherewithal to get after the hard things, uh, we, we are making great progress here, which is awesome. Um, so if you think, you know, Northern, um, you know, it's going to take us a while to get there, but in 2027, you know, we'll be opening up uh, 150 fully electric, uh, hopefully platinum LEED certified bus garage with a uh, solar roof. I mean, that's a um, pretty cool uh, trio of things we're stringing together there. Just to give folks a sense, of some of the challenges. It took us about uh, just over four years to get through NEPA, uh, you know, for this project. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just took a lot of fortitude. And at the end of the day, this is going to be an awesome facility for the community. Uh, and same with Bladensburg. I mean, you know, um, really complex project, uh, largest bus garage we have in terms of, you know, uh, you know bus uh, coaches. And, you know, again, lead platinum, um, you know, facility that, that we're targeting. We're looking good today. Uh, and that project is well under construction and also scheduled uh, for 2027. But just wanted to highlight, you know, the uniques, you know, complexities of these two awesome, you know, rehabilitations, which are certainly always more challenging uh, than greenfield projects, and we're, we're finally getting after those hard-to-do things. Um, don't, doesn't, uh, you know, get talked about a lot, but we do move through these with the same degree of intensity. Uh, one is, uh, people are probably aware, we have hundreds of rooms uh, in our underground system that provide critical infrastructure to the operation. Uh, when we find issues uh, that require repair, you know, um, such as a mechanical room up at Bethesda that was, you know, significantly deteriorated, uh, you know, we got after that, you know, in a very efficient way uh, and made the appropriate, uh, you know, fixes. So we, you know, we don't talk about, you know, those types of things, uh, but internally, uh, quite frankly, those are just as important, if not more important. Uh, than, you know, some of the big projects we talk in a, in a public-facing way. And also, um, you know, an awesome project we got to work on with M Montgomery County uh, up at the Bethesda Medical Complex uh, was adding a new entrance on the east side um, of, of the freeway there uh, where folks can now access that without having to cross the road. Um, you know, awesome project, uh, you know, working through our joint development group uh, that we also wanted to highlight. And so next steps, you know, is, is um, you know, Tom and myself uh, work through this. We'll certainly be proposing, you know, the new six-year uh, CIP uh, and the 2024 capital budget in December. Uh, in the winter, having budget work sessions and a deeper looking, um, more of a, you know, a calendar look at uh, what programs uh, we expect to have, you know, in the coming years. And then, of course, in the spring, uh, we'll work through um, adoption of the capital improvement program. And that concludes our briefing. Um, certainly open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any uh, comments or questions. Jennifer, do you want to? Sure. Director Babers. Yes. Thank you all so much for the um, overview. I just had one quick question. So we indicated anticipated completion dates for most of the um, capital projects, such as the um, Yellow Line Tunnel. but I'm seeing that we we still have not a good sense of of the Potomac Yard. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, now that we're done with the tie-in, uh, we are honing in, you know, on on a closer date. But there's still coordination uh, that you know that we need to take place, you know, with the city to better establish, you know, a firm date. 
Uh, we are absolutely confident, um, you know, it, it is certainly going to be in the first half, uh, you know, of the calendar year, but we've got to tune in on, you know, a more specific date. Calendar year 2023? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Oh, all right. Thank you. Mr. Smedberg. Uh, Mr. Roth, Yellow Line Tunnel, could you give us a little more detail of where we are? Are we on schedule? Um, you, are we past the point of where there are going to be no surprises, I guess, is the <laughs> direct way <laughs> yes, to Mr. answer Chairman, that uh, question? Um, you know, we, we certainly are on schedule as of today. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you, you know, you're never past the point of no surprises on these major rehabilitation projects. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm smiling I, I, too much. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, the, the reality is, uh, we, we've got an excellent contractor. We got our A team on the job. They're doing a great job. Um, you know, we're very confident where we're at. Uh, you know, that said, uh, it would be um, premature for me to, you know, uh, you know, declare yeah. victory at this point for sure. Uh, but things are going very well. And typically, you know, on jobs of this magnitude, you know, getting in and starting well, uh, you know, is a great recipe, you know, for finishing strong. So we feel confident, uh, but but certainly we'll need to continue to provide the board updates, you know, on our progress. Yeah. So is it fair to say the major issues that you highlighted when you first brought this to us are being addressed and they're on schedule? Yes, sir. I, I mean, I, I can share with you, you know, our the biggest issue, the, you know, the, the intent of this project was to get after the, the, leaking, the leaking, right? The, you know, the corroded tunnel. And I can tell you our team has experienced on numerous occasions uh, where we've been making sure we're addressing all of the weak steel plates, where we've been sounding it and tapping it with hand tools, and we've punched through it, uh, you know, with a hand tool and have, you know, experienced significant leaking. And although that's not good, uh, it's a clear example of precisely why we're there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Dr. Lowe. Okay. Um, uh, I, going back to the beginning of the presentation, you don't have to move the slides, but um, in terms of you've, you started out by reviewing the grants that we had applied for and won. Winning grants is awesome. Um, can you review for me what electrification grants we have applied for and what was the outcome? Yes, be happy to. Um, in summary form, and we can follow up with um, some additional detail. We we have applied for um, several uh, electrification grants, uh, specifically for uh, the Northern and Bladensburg facilities, um, both the federal uh, uh, low and no emission grant program and the competitive, um, um, sorry, uh, uh, bus and bus facilities program, uh, as well as the RAISE program. We were not successful this round in uh, those facility grant applications. Um, the projects are, are still proceeding, um, and the electrification is built into those into those project plans. Um, however, uh, uh, this this most recent round we were, were not successful. We do have an awarded uh, competitive grant um, for um, some initial electric vehicles um, the, uh, through the low no pro, uh, low and no emission uh, vehicle program um, from a couple of years ago uh, uh, to get started on our electric. Okay, and I, I think I've asked this at previous board meetings before, but like your debriefing yes. with FTA to find out why we're not winning and what we need to do differently? Yes, yes, we, we have debriefed in each case where um, we were not successful uh, to identify you know, opportunities to improve applications in the future and to, and to um, understand how to make them more competitive as we move forward. Okay, winning is important. Um, are there any electrification grant calls that we have not applied for? No. And big picture, it seems like um, we, we won when we applied for vehicles. We didn't win when we applied for facilities. Could this be part of the issue here? Is it that these grant calls are favoring vehicles? Uh, um, there, there's, it, it is unlikely that, it's, that that was the, the, the reason we did not we're not successful in the applications. Um, we are, however, going to look at um, uh, in, in future applications, more dynamic applications that look at vehicles and, and facilities um, to ensure we have uh, uh, competitive applications, regardless of what the criteria end up being. 
Okay, and in addition to the environmental benefits of electrification, are we emphasizing in our applications the substantial equity? Yes. Impacts yes. that electrification of our bus facilities could achieve? Yes. Okay. Any additional questions? I just, I just wanted to make a quick comment. So well, one to Dr. Lowe. Um, I can't, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe the FTA, something like Tom, you might have a seven or eight to one ratio of uh, applications to awards. So we are clearly disappointed we did not win. We've been talking to FDA and USDOT, but I just wanted to make everyone aware, I think it's like a seven or eight to one ratio of, 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 of application need versus uh, money awarded. Uh, hopefully that means we're in a great position next year for some awards because other people won some pretty significant awards. I would say on the electrification, um, there look, could be a little bit that we, we are a little bit behind on that, and I think it's, it's fair to acknowledge that. But I think uh, we've got a little shot of B12 into our electrification program recently. And as you'll see with Northern, we're going all in on electrification with Northern. Uh, we're talking about how do we accelerate our program. Uh, that, that's also going to be part of not just what we present a little bit on the capital plan coming up, but this aspirational vision for Metro that we've been kind of talking about, what we, what we are or what we can be. We have a delta in funding to get the entire fleet to go zero emission in all of our facilities that we don't have, even with the dedicated funding to pay for. So as we frame that up in early 23, both, you know, whether it's on the rail side, CBT, communications-based train control, and d different ways, you know, platform screen doors and all this other stuff that we, we quite frankly, not only could be doing, we should be doing. On the bus side, it's the same deal. We want to become zero emission and also run high frequency bus in a lot more of the region. These things cost money. And we need, I think, a staff to present what that vision looks like to bring to the board and the community at large to see what those trade-offs are. So that's, that's one point. Second, on this slide, I want to really highlight, we didn't, the, the, the team didn't talk about it in detail, but I know Chair Schmidberg, you mentioned this uh, frequently to me. And one of the things that we want to really highlight here is preview capital project schedule outlook. Uh, and what that really means is uh, in the first quarter of, of 23, the team wants to come and we need to, I think, we owe the public a better look ahead on our capital uh, outages and shutdowns. We are never going to have a, a rail system without any impacts. That's just the way our system's designed. It's like the roads, right? People shut down roads and do other things. The key is how to give people as much transparency and advance uh, warning, if you will, of those. And then two, how do we maximize every single ounce of those for productivity uh, to, get, to get in and out. And so what we want to really highlight is what, what a, even, even maybe, a, um, excuse me, 24, 36 month look ahead could be. And then obviously it gets more granular as we get into 12 months and in six months and three months. So uh, the team did that a little bit with the yellow line shutdown. But one of the things the team and I talked about is let's give a longer look ahead so people could really see the, the, the work that is ahead inside, especially on the rail side in, in the tunnels and, and on the right of way. So uh, I know Chair Smedberg, you've been talking about that. And I think that will help too with the, the community's confidence to see where we are going to be investing. Because, um, you know, Chair McKay from Fairfax said this the other day, and I think these words are spot on. We need, that, that's what these are. They are investments in the system for the next generation. They're not just spending money. They have a purpose and they're safety-based, they're state of good repair, the reliability, um, they're customer service oriented. It's really to make the, the railroad and or the bus system the, the next generation system for, for the region. So I just want to highlight yeah, that no, the team's and, working and on that. Randy, I, I really appreciate that because it in BTC and in other venues, we do talk about that as investments. And I think the public in particular um, really does want to hear from us when these projects are coming along in a timely fashion so they can plan and not just be, and, and even the leaders within the jurisdictions feel at times that, you know, these things have just sort of been sprung upon them and they really don't have time to, to really react and plan appropriately. So. I, any step we can take in that direction is, is great. So. Um, I, I just, that reminds me of another question that I forgot to ask, which is I, I need some clarity about where we are on Northern um, and what the phrase fully electric means, because I thought that where Northern was, was having diesel tanks and that when Northern reopened, that we were still gonna be running some bio diesel buses out of there. What is the status? Uh, all the buses that we're going to run out of Northern are going to be zero emission buses. So 
I'm, this is like a massive change. I feel like I've asked about this a billion times, and this is news. Well, billion and one, you got the you got the answer. So we 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 got the team together. We're executing. We're gonna we're gonna get more aggressive on our zero emission program. Um, you know, the, the team has worked really hard, and that's, that's what we're going to deliver at Northern. But if we're ready to say that, there should be like a button I can press right now that drops like a ton of balloons. I mean, this like. We have an event. Okay. We're going to have an event coming up at Northern. I'm so, so happy to hear this. I don't know why I'm the last to know, but I'm so happy to hear it. Thank you. Glad that, I'm glad that you're having a whole week of happiness. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Okay. Um, well, with uh, no further business to come before the committee, we will stand adjourned. The board meeting is up next. I understand we're going to take a two minute break prior to the board meeting to reset. I'm Paul Smedberg, Chair of the WMATA Board. Thank you for being here today at our board meeting. Since we just called the roll in our previous meeting, we'll move right ahead to the next agenda item, and that is approval of the agenda. If there are no objections, I'd like to consider the agenda approved as presented with one change. I'm going to remove uh, the consent item regarding the local 639 collective bargaining agreement. Any objections to that from anyone? Hearing none, the agenda is approved as amended. Now we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. We have four sets of minutes for approval, the board meeting from October 27th, the special board meeting from October 3rd, and executive sessions from October 27th and November 3rd. I'd like to consider these minutes approved as presented. Anyone have any comments or objections to any sets of those minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as presented. Next, we'll move on to the employee spotlight. This month, we have three special uh, recognitions uh, for our employee spotlight. I'd like to note that we'll do photos at the end once we've concluded uh, recognizing each group of individuals. First, I'm pleased to recognize Executive Administrative Specialist Melody Miha. Is Melanie here? Melanie, good morning. Miha, sorry. Um, last month, while traveling in the system with a group of employees, Ms. Mejia, uh, witnessed a customer who had fallen on the escalator at Gallery Place Station. The customer's coat became trapped in the escalator's teeth, and she was screaming with fear. Ms. Mejia leaped, leapt into action, jumping uh, over the customer to push the escalator's emergency power shutoff button just in time to avoid serious injury to the customer, her colleagues, and herself. Today, we want to thank Ms. Mejia from our uh, Department of Strategy, Planning, and Program Management. Her quick actions demonstrated how familiarization with Metro's operations and training allowed employees to be well prepared to keep everyone safe uh, on the system. Thank you, Melanie. Next, I'm pleased to be joined by Liz Price, Vice President of Real Estate and Parking, and Stephen Senderland, a Director of Real Estate Development. Steve and Liz, oh, there you are. Okay. Good morning. Uh, they're here proudly representing our real estate team, whose accomplishments are capturing national and local res rec recognition. Our real estate team recently received several awards related to their work, including the National 2022 Urban Land Institute's Robert C. Larson Housing Policy Leadership Award for our partnership with Amazon's Housing Equity Fund. Second, the Best Renovation Slash Reuse Award in the Mid-Atlantic 
from engineering news record for our headquarters building. Third, the outstanding plan or program award from Lambda Alpha International, a land economic industry association for our 10 year strategic plan for joint development. And last, and the team has been named as a project award finalist with the DC chapter of the commercial real estate women for our headquarters building that award will be announced later this month. We want to congratulate the entire real estate team for your award winning performance and all you do, whether it's managing our real estate portfolio, overseeing our joint development program, or coordinating our transit oriented or oriented development and redevelopment. Uh, you are most deserving of all these awards. It's really been great to see all the progress that's been made in that area. So thank you so much. And finally, I'd like to call on our four, uh, four of our leaders in the Silver Line Extension Project to be recognized on behalf of the thousands or hundreds of Metro employees from across all departments who helped to make this week's uh, service launch to success. Neil Knott. Neil. Shiva Pant. Shiva, good morning. Andy Off. And Lynn Bowersock. Hey, why don't you, why don't you come up? Rashiva Pant, the Chief of Special Projects Management and Oversight, and Neil Knott, Director of Dulles Corridor Metro Rail Project. This has been a culmination of more than 20 years of work together. Amazing. Their roles complement one another, with Shiva working on policy and coordination with project partners, and Neil focused on technical engineering and interfacing with the airport's authority. Lynn and Andy also deserve recognition for their partnership and leadership to get the job done. Lynn took a break from the, her role as, at the helm of Metro's communications department to call back on her prior uh, project delivery experience and Andy and his capital program team are delivering massive projects to strengthen and expand transit service in the region. In recognizing the four of you, the, the board extends ex their thanks uh, and appreciation for all the men and women who made this project a reality over the decades of planning and construction and in the final months before launch. So thank you so, so much. And before we come up, I'd also like, I think it would be fair to recognize, you know, again, we've mentioned all the hundreds of people that worked on this, but also the safety team and what they had to do to get this project uh, over the line. And not only that, but so we could have some 7,000 series cars to actually run great service and cut down on headways. Uh, the legal team, uh, Patty and your folks, getting the, the agreements through and uh, coming to uh, you know, an agreement with the trust. So all these departments um, you know, really do deserve recognition, but you guys were the leaders of that and really, really appreciate that. So uh, how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna have the entire board. Uh, first, Melanie. with the Prince police officer and Melanie after her, her rescue efforts. And the customer gave her a big hug and just thanked her so much. So the timing was amazing. So we're really proud of you all. Thank <laughs> you. 
open those up too. Yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you so much. Last but certainly not least, Christmas twice. <laughs> 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 took the other day really well. Yeah, that what you gonna do, right? Yeah. We can take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I you guys. And then you know, why don't we have you little, little things? No, 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 go, just go to the other end. It's Do we have a Oh, squeeze it in? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right, come on. Okay. Okay, now we'll move on to public comment and reports by our advisory boards. First, we'll hear from customers and stakeholders. Uh, we have one uh, in person, and then we'll go to the online uh, submissions. First, we have uh, Mr. Bill Orleans. Ms. Orleans. Good morning. You have three minutes. Thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Turn your mic on. Turn the mic on. Should I have to repeat my joke or? or? Uh, apparently the board and committee rooms are now one in the same. My first time seeing it, I don't know if when this building was reconstructed, it was anticipated that the board room uh, should not accommodate as many people as it once did, maybe hoping that there would be less members of the public coming to speak to the board. Uh, if so, that was a mistake. I think that we can envision future meetings where people would be required to stand in the hallway even if they could get through security. On that matter, I hope the board will instruct the general manager, I don't know if he's here, I've yet to meet him. You're the general manager, Mr. Clark. Uh, I hope to have the opportunity to speak to you after the meeting is over. I hope you will be instructed to further instruct uh, the people at the front desk. I don't know whether there were MATA employees or building contracted security or not, that these meetings, now that they're occurring again in public, the public has a right to enter the meeting. The, I was confronted by two people who seemed surprised that I thought I should have the right to come into the board uh, meeting room. So I, well, if that was a mistake, it should still, it should be rectified. And I hope in the future, nobody will have that problem. They had to ask somebody who said, yeah, they're allowed in. Uh, I came today to speak primarily because uh, the then general manager in early 2021, uh, I was informed, had made the decision effectively unilaterally that it was no longer appropriate to distribute uh, timetables, bus timetables. At the time I was told that, I thought maybe it was reasonable because it was fairly early in the pandemic and so many of the bus routes were being changed that they couldn't be adhered to and if they we're distributing timetables that were worthless as far as informing the public when the bus theoretically would arrive. Uh, they would be made more useless because of the pandemic. Uh, subsequently, I've been told, uh, I inquired about this earlier this calendar year at a meeting and was told that it was not a final decision. I've not had further uh, instruction as to whether that was a final decision with regard to timetable, bus timetables in the future. I hope not, sir. 
I hope that it will be recognized that not everybody can go online and uh, view the expected arrival and departure of a bus at a given stop. Some people uh, still require and would benefit whether they require or not from having a paper timetable. Uh, I'm one and I hope uh, Again, the determination will be made that at some point in the near future, we will again distribute uh, uh, paper timetables. I, I want to note something that I'm surprised and pleased by. Uh, a former member of staff has risen to a position on the board. Uh, I would hope in future more members of Metro staff would uh, find themselves positioned on the board, but from a broader array of work uh, experience within WMATA. Someday I would hope to see not somebody from the front office, but a bus driver or a train operator or a mechanic sitting in one of these chairs. I note also a former member of the community. Well, she's still presumably a member of the community, but then when I knew her, she was without status. Uh, she's now positioned on the board. I would hope more members from the community, maybe not those, including those who have not achieved status, would someday find themselves in these chairs. Uh, that's not your decision to make, but I make that hope public, uh, hoping that I live long enough to see more members of staff and community being board members. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Well, we are all, we are all members in the yeah. community. Yeah, okay. Uh, next, we have our online. Yes, Mr. Chair, we have several on online comments. First comment is from Howard Crystal, the District of Columbia. I'm writing to urge that WMATA make the investments necessary to rapidly transition the bus fleet away from fossil fuels. The climate emergency demands that we electrify everything as we move to a renewable energy grid. Electrifying the bus will also give us a cleaner, will give us cleaner air and a healthy, healthier environment, a win-win-win for all of us. Please make this a high priority in your planning. Other cities are moving forward. Other cities are moving much faster than our region must continue to be climate leaders. Thank you for, for your efforts on behalf of the city and region. Next comment is from Judah Lesser, of Prince George's County. At the last meeting, Metro pro proposed turning back the yellow line at Mount Vernon. However, I would encourage Metro to consider instead running the yellow line all the way to Greenbelt and turning the green line back at Mount Vernon. This should be verified with ridership data but I suspect there are more trips from Northern Green Line to the Southern Yellow Line than from Northern Green Line to Southern Green Line. Next comment is from Tom Quinn of the District of Columbia. I'm submitting this comment to urge WMATA board to insist that the pending order to modernize the WMATA bus fleet require that the entire order consist of electric buses. For four years, I lived less than a block from the West Bus Garage, Western Bus Garage in Friendship Heights and the smell from the bu diesel buses was a constant presence in the neighborhood, as was the noise. I'm also urging the WMATA board to require that pending modernization of the western and, bu and northern bus garages only be designed for electric buses and not diesel buses, and the other bus garages also be converted to electric buses only. Thank you for considering this request, which will improve our local air quality and also lessen WMATA's carbon footprint. Tom Quinn, ANC Commissioner. Next comment is from Michael Litt of the District of Columbia. Dear Board of Directors, I am a car-free renter in Ward 6 of Washington, D.C. I frequently ride Metro Rail and Metro Bus. I love that the Metro gives me the freedom to get around the DMV without a car. However, this doing so is more sustainable. That will require moving away from, pollu from pollution and climate emissions caused by fossil fuels. While I appreciate WMATA's zero bus emissions, zero emissions bus goals you have adopted, I urge you hasten the, the timeline. As the new United Nations emissions report published in the end of October warned, the window for limiting climate emissions is closing, giving that transportation in the District of, in the, in the District of Columbia second leading source of greenhouse gases emissions, accounting for 21% of such emissions. Due to time, I'm gonna cut some of these short because I know we're, we're, we're ready over time, but these will be posted online. Next set of comments from Carol Pickens of Arlington County. Thanks for opening the Silver Line. A boom for travelers. But I have a comment suggestion. The weekend morning schedule, two dollars, not opening until 7 a.m., combined with discontinuing the 5A bus, 
is problematic for folks with morning flights from Dulles. I live in Crystal City. Assuming about one hour to get from Crystal City to, to Dulles, giving impeccable timing for train arrivals at both stations, leaving Crystal City at 7.15 or so, transferring in Roslyn, plus five or 10 minute walk to get to the airport itself, plus another hour to get through security, check-in, and gate 30, at, at the gate 30 minutes before it closes. The earliest flight I could take would be 9.30. My stars were rarely aligned that perfectly. Absent Metro to Dulles, I have taken a 5A leaving Roslyn at 5.45 and arriving at Dulles at about 6.25. But, but that option is being eliminated and it's not all about me. What about the many airport workers who rely on public transportation to get to work, including on the weekends? Would it be possible to start the server line service at 5 a.m. every day, including weekends, or restore the 5A bus on weekends? This weekend morning schedule issue is currently planned, as currently planned is problematic for many people. I hope we're able to come up with a, with a solution. Thanks, Carol Pickens. Next set of comments from Elliot Nijin, representing Union of Concerned Scientists and the Metro Electric Bus Coalition. Was the Metro Board aware that three months ago, the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Transit Administration announced 1.66 million in grants, billion, thank you, billion in grants to 150 bus fleets and facilities across the country to transition to zero emissions technologies? Los Angeles Transit Agency, which plans to electrify a fleet of 2,320 buses by 2030, received more than 104 million to help pay for the transition. Boston Transit Agency, which is slated to electrify 1,100 buses by 2040, received 116 million. Boston's Transit Agency is slated to electrify, oh, sorry, New York City's bus authority, like Boston, is scheduled to transition 5,800 buses, zero emissions by 2014, also got 116 million. Smaller, age, smaller transit agencies in our region also want FTA grants. Again, with time constraints, I'm gonna move to the next set of comments, but we will be posting these online. Next set of comments from Stephen Banaschek, representing the Virginia, Virginia Sierra Club. A top agenda item at the 27th UN Conference of the Parties Climate Negotiations taking place this week in Egypt is how to implement global methane, how to implement the global methane pledge, an agreement signed last year by 119 countries to cut methane emissions by 30% this decade. It is critical to achieve that goal to avoid the worst consequences of climate change because over the first 20 years after its release, methane is more than 80 times more potent at warming the planet than carbon dioxide. Instead of moving expeditiously to wean the Metro bus fleet off of methane, the primary component of natural gas, Metro plans to expand the percentage of compressed natural gas buses in its fleet continue to in its fleet, continue to purchase them until 2030 and build a new CNG fuel facility in Shepherd Park at the Shepherd Parkway garage. The Metro managers claim that CNG buses are lower emissions, but they are no cleaner than diesel buses. They emit significantly more carbon monoxide and, hydro and hydrocarbons than diesel buses, and according to the Argonne National Library data, are responsible for more than 6% left, less life cycle global warming emissions than diesel buses. Again, I'm gonna cut short to go to the next set of comments. These will be posted. And that concludes our comments. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted the comments. Uh, next, we move to the Access Accessibility Advisory Committee report. Pat, good morning. All right, thank you very much. Is this mic working? It is working, yep. All right, great. You can take your hand off it, just so we don't okay. get background noise. Oh, I'm it's sorry. It's good. Good. No, it's good. All right, great. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Pat Sheehan. I've just been reelected as chair of the AAC for another uh, two years. Uh, and it's good to be back in front of the board, so thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I want to be able to do over the next couple of years is to make sure that we have uh, the leadership of AAC coming before the board, other leaders rather than me. It's important that the AAC 
uh, continue to represent the disability community. So growing our leadership within AAC is important and also ensuring that over time that the board will get excellent uh, input I think is incredibly important. And so we plan to do that over these next couple of years. Uh, I'd like to thank a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of people, uh, most notably Phil Posner for the eight years that he served as chair of the AAC. Uh, he's still in leadership, he'll still be advising, so we haven't lost Phil, uh, and thanks for that. And Jim Hamry, who is retiring uh, uh, in the, as director of bus planning uh, over the last, uh, with me at least over t the last 10 years or so, uh, he has just been terrific to work with. Very professional, uh, listened to our needs and, and what we wanted to do, <clears throat> how we wanted to do it, took our input, and always was straightforward, professional, and really knew his, his, his job. He is going to be missed. So thank you for that, um, for his service. Um, the congratulations on the silver line, the, um, the input, uh, the AAC did have extensive input on the silver line. We were, had an opportunity to look at the uh, construction and uh, we were pleased with the, um, the, the access that has been built in <clears throat> as it is throughout, throughout the entire system. So congratulations on a fine project. We will be looking at how Metro Access is, um, uh, is going to be uh, implemented uh, through the Silver Line area and we uh, will be giving input on that. We have, have a good team that is looking at the Metro Access uh, issues. As far as our, our activities over the last um, uh, last month, uh, we worked on the uh, Better Bus Network. We have three people assigned to that project, and they will be uh, providing input uh, with respect to that project that was covered uh, earlier today at, at this meeting. Uh, I think the equity and inclusion, uh, making sure that, uh, that uh, folks with disabilities will be able to utilize the system will be uh, acknowledged and, and we're looking forward to that. We also had two members of our team working with the, um, uh, with the emergency bus bridge on the Silver Line to ensure that people with disabilities, particularly people with wheelchairs, could, um, could utilize the emergency bus bridge on the Silver Line. So appreciate the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, input from the AAC on those matters. Uh, and um, we also looked at the uh, uh, implementation of the new Garmin GPS system within the uh, Metro Access fleet. Uh, we think that's gonna make a huge improvement. Congratulations on that. We're looking forward to real-time information. We know they're gonna improve traffic um, congestion and information so that uh, routes can be more efficient. And uh, I think that'll be a plus, so that's a couple of years in, uh, that we've been waiting for something like that. I think the Rangers been, have been around since 2000 anyway. So we've been putting up with those for about 20 years. Pleased to have a better GPS system. Uh, two other projects that we're looking forward to working with. Uh, there is a Waymaps project, which is an internal GPS system, which is going to be implemented in uh, all the uh, internal stations uh, in the um, WMATA system. Uh, and they will be uh, uh, starting a soft launch in that project um, in the next uh, month or so. Uh, disability groups from uh, Virginia, DC, and Maryland have already been uh, working with WMATA, uh, also ADA programs, uh, Tom Pay, and the Waymaps people to put their project on the map. So that's uh, going to be very interesting. Uh, I think that covers pretty much everything that I needed to uh, say today. Are there any questions for me? Does anyone have any comments or questions for Mr. I raced through all that because I know we're short on time. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Pat. Great to see you. Congratulations on your appointment and we look forward to working with Good. you. Good, well, we do too. Thank you so all much. Right. Nice seeing you again. Next, I'll call on Mr. Mayor, the Riders Advisory Council Chair to provide uh, the committee's report. Brian, good morning.
Thank you much, uh, Chairman Smedberg and fellow members of the board and General Manager Clark. Uh, thank you so much for having us and I'd be remiss if I did not uh, also extend a hearty congratulations uh, to you all as well as the hardworking staff and contractors and uh, members of the community who helped make the Silver Line Phase Two uh, happen. Uh, it was a great event on Tuesday and I know that the benefits it's going to bring to the region whether that be professional, residential, or recreational, it's certainly going to be very uh, transformative. And it was a pleasure being there, and I'm excited to start riding uh, that portion of the Silver Line more frequently. And thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the Riders Advisory Council's report for November of 2022. Uh, the big topic that we took uh, that we addressed over the course of our meeting was service and fare optimization concepts. Uh, we do know that the FY24 budget, uh, specifically the operating budget, uh, conversations have been ongoing and will continue to happen over the course of the se uh, next several months. Uh, the RAC would like to thank Mark Irvin and Alex Block from Metro's Office of Strategy and Policy who came to discuss various concepts for fare and Metro Rail service optimization at our November's RAC meeting. And we appreciate their willingness to engage with us in this incredibly complex topic, uh, and frankly, one that is structural in nature. And so some of our recommendations address that as well. Uh, first of all, you know, just as a, a brief comment, we are very comforted by kind of that FY23 Q1 operational expense savings. Um, and it's nice to know that those are also structural in nature, but there's a lot more work to do for our FY24 budget and beyond. And in anticipation for the FY24 operating budget discussions, uh, the RAC recommends that really any proposals that are either included in the budget or certainly that are approved by the board uh, ensures that riding Metro is simpler uh, more convenient, uh, more equitable, uh, ensures that it drives ridership and is ultimately financially responsible. With that in mind, uh, we do have uh, several concepts that we think that the board should move forward with. Uh, first being the elimination of the differential between peak and off-peak fares uh, for a couple of reasons. I think notably because compared to historical operating patterns, the differential service between peak and off peak has been reduced. We also know that ridership habits have changed certainly since the start of the pandemic and will continue to evolve uh, as we go through our recovery. And frankly, I think it's also more of a fairness concept than just the cost onto the riders. Uh, we also talked extensively about the merits of a flat fare system. And as we all know, some of the various proposals uh, had several different pros and cons, and the RAC is not gonna recommend whether or not we should have a flat fare system or what that number should be. Uh, we do think that it is certainly interesting and that if the board decides to move forward with that, then they will pick that right magic number for us to arrive at. Nevertheless, if we do decide to maintain and keep a distance-based system, we think that the fare structure uh, should be revised, uh, notably ensuring that the formula is uh, simpler to understand and reducing the number of fare increments. We also recommend that uh, the board incorporates a reduced fare for low-income riders, uh, and this will build on Metro's current reduced fares for senior citizens and individuals with disabilities. Uh, we also recommend an increase in overall Metro rail system operating hours. Uh, Carol Pickens from the public kind of beat me to the punch, and that's notably providing uh, earlier and later service on the weekends. Our hope is that uh, increased demand uh, travel, both with re recovery, but also with phase two of the Silver Line and travel to Dulles uh, would merit that increase of operating hours. And lastly, we do not offer a concrete recommendation on any specific service changes, uh, but we do think that gathering more information, uh, data, feedback from the public about the various service changes, uh, increased green and yellow and orange line service, and the reallocation of red line service to the inner portion of the green line should be explored. 
we also had the Better Bus event that preceded our RAC meeting, and several RAC members took place, uh, uh, were at the Better Bus uh, Meet the Project team event here at the headquarters. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to interact with Metro staff and stakeholders as you all seek input on how to improve Metro Bus, and uh, we're looking forward to the development of that particular project and how it's going to help the various members of the community. And lastly, uh, the RAC's kind of outreach and information gathering. Uh, we have our annual report committee, which I think uh, was in our previous report, has been working to expand RAC members' uh, interaction and outreach with fellow riders. And uh, we're looking forward to providing you with further updates as pertains to that project. Uh, I know that was a lot, but thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brian. Any questions or comments for Mr. Mayor? Tracy. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank the REC for these recommendations. These are timely, sensible, and actionable. I have been waiting to hear from the REC since I got on this board. Great work. Keep it up. Personally, this is the kind of input that we need from the REC. I will give this great weight. Keep it up. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, and have a happy Thanksgiving. All right, take care. All right, Dick. Sarah, I should mention, uh, uh, I was at Wheelie. I took the Silver Line out to Wheelie, and I was waiting for the employee yes. bus shuttle. And Brian happened to be there. And, <laughs> and he was going to take uh, one of the last runs on the, on the 5A, uh, and I said, hey, you want to join on the employee bus shuttle? And he said, where is it? I said, well, don't worry. They're not going to go without me. So <laughs> I made sure Brian kept to the event on time. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes our advisory committee reports. Uh, now we'll move on to the chair's report. Uh, first, I want to recognize this week's historic accomplishment, a major milestone, really, the opening of the Silver Line extension to Ashburn. Thank you to everyone who attended the opening and who is now riding silver. As noted on Tuesday, the Silver Line extension will improve mobility and provide greater access to jobs, entertainment, and shopping destinations, not to mention a direct ride to Washington Dulles International Airport with more than 600 flights arriving and departing each day. Metro Rail has a proven track record of activating neighborhood streets, creating a sense of place for civic spaces, and attracting businesses and well-paying jobs. This is decades in the making, and I know I speak uh, from my fellow board members past and present. We are so proud of what happened uh, there on Tuesday. And it really is a, a, a really important thing, not only for the region, uh, but for this organization. I mean, it sim you know, symbolizes so much about what this organization can be and what it will be in the future. and. Um, you know, I think it's a real, you know, turning point for us and an opportunity for real growth in terms of ridership. So really, really exciting. Um, and actually, last night I heard from someone, I had an Instagram post, uh, or Facebook, Instagram and Facebook post, and someone who I went to college with contacted me. And her father worked for Metro back in the day and was one of the chief designers or engineers on the original Red Line. And so she said, wow, all, after all this time, she goes, if my dad was still alive, he'd be really proud. So you know, really interesting, uh, the number of people that reached out and still follow Metro and the stuff. She's a doctor, I forgot where in Chicago area. But anyway, um, so yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, now we have a video we'd like to show of some highlights uh, from the celebration. Well, I'll tell you what, the Silver Line opening represents something very special. Um, it's about vision, it's about teamwork, and it's about regional prosperity for me. Connecting many, many people to opportunities. When I was the mayor of Richmond, I saw a wooden table mock-up 
of rail through Tyson's to Dulles in somebody's office in Fairfax. And I said, what's this? This was in 2000. And they said, well, it's got a lot of dust all over it, but we need to get rail to Dulles. And so I started working on it then when I was running for lieutenant governor. When I got elected governor, I told my secretary of transportation, I don't know how, but at the end of four years, we're going to have this financed under contract and a shovel in the ground. And we did. March of 09, my last year as governor, we put a shovel in the ground. And here, 13 years later, we're opening the whole thing. I feel very, very good. This is the single hardest thing I've ever worked on in public life. And so it feels great to be here today and to know how great it's going to be for commuters and travelers and people who want to go shopping or go visit friends. So it's really exciting. Good morning, I'm Paul Smedberg, Chair of the WMATA Board. And what this means for me personally is it, it means a great deal to WMATA and it's a real growth opportunity. But I think more than the Commonwealth of Virginia and the region is connecting people to possibilities and opportunities. And I think this is really great. It's more than just trains and planes, but it's really connecting people to opportunities and possibilities. So thank you for being here today. Hi, my name is Brian Meyer. I'm chairman of the Riders Advisory Council. This is an exciting day here at Dulles Airport where we're opening up the Silver Line. The Silver Line Phase 2 is going to provide so many professional, recreational, and residential opportunities to the people in the greater DMV area. It's super exciting, and I hope you join me in starting to ride the Silver Line. And uh, go Metro! Hello, I'm Lucinda Babers, the DC board member for WMATA. Oh wow, this Silver Line extension is fabulous. It means everything, not only to me personally, because I'm an avid WMATA rider, both rail and bus, but also I need to take Dallas occasionally when I go out of country. And this will be so much more convenient than the 5A Metro bus. And so I am just so excited. I'm excited for Virginia and what this will mean for them in terms of economic development, because we all need economic development during these post pandemic times, whether it's DC, Maryland or Virginia. And so this will be a game changer for Virginia in terms of bringing people to these outlying um, areas where they really need to get to. So I am just thrilled to be here today to make sure that I can witness the first um, train ride on the new WMATA Silver Line extension to Dallas Airport and Ashford. So the Silver Line opening is just a fantastic testament to all of the work over decades, really, that um, leaders in the, in the government, the state government, local government, leaders at WMATA have put into it. This is a fabulous, fantastic event and a great day for the region. For me personally, obviously it represents all these great Metro employees and our friends and partners around the region all coming together to deliver for the community. So my number one thing I'm excited for is to actually not only get the ribbon cut, to welcome passengers on board. Uh, we, we are here to serve the community and that's what today is all about. So it really was a great day, and it was great to really see a number of our jurisdictional partners, elected officials, and other community leaders there who were so excited about this happening because they too have put so much work into this and, um, and have put a lot on the line. As, as Senator Kane said, it, it was really a tough slog there for a long time to get this done. I've actually seen that model that he referenced. I was at a regional meeting once in an office, I think it was the Northern Virginia Regional Commission uh, office somewhere, and they actually had that model there, and it really did look pretty sad, actually. 
was all <laughs> dusty and the wood was sort of faded and you know it's not like the new fancy things that the architectural groups put together but uh, it was it was really when he, when he mentioned that I had a chuckle because I do remember actually seeing that piece long ago so anyway thank you to everyone uh, and now I'll turn it over to the general manager Mr. Clark. Thank you chair so yes we did a thing right all of us so uh, congratulations to the board to all the staff uh, on, our, on our big week uh, with opening Silver Line to Dulles and to Loudoun County. So, uh, plus it was fun to be out at the other events too, not just the big event, but we had, uh, I know Board Member Letourneau is on uh, virtually, but we had a great uh, little event in Ashburn, then we had one at Innovation Center, then one at Reston Town Center, and I believe uh, one of the stations might be doing one today, and then I think Loudoun County is doing Ashburn, I think on Saturday as well. So, it really is a com community celebration uh, which is pretty amazing. One of the things that I, I really enjoyed was our, uh, on top of, you know, as the chair mentioned, uh, all the electeds and, and people that put a lot of effort and time into the Silver Line over years, was the enthusiasm of our customers, and I guess we'll even go uh, Metro enthusiasts. And uh, we had over 400 people that submitted uh, their favorite Metro memory to, to win one of the limited silver tickets. So we had 50 silver tickets uh, with a plus one. And it was great because a lot of people figured out a way to, uh, I guess maybe skip school, I guess is that, uh, just, just be straight up what happened. But they're learning life lessons uh, versus academic. And uh, to see kids too, when we got the chance, a lot of the kids got up into the cab and hit the horn and you know, just got to see and feel uh, a train and, and be part of that. And this is this life moment. So this is just a picture uh, that one of the team members took and it's just fantastic. And so many people were happy. Uh, and that's what, you know, to me, I, someone, I think one of the, one of the uh, reporters said, is this your favorite day as general manager? And I said, well, yeah, it's, look how happy everyone is. And, and we have this privilege to bring happiness to people. And, and that was really an exciting part. So we also had people on the train. One person uh, said to me, they rode, two different people said they rode the original, uh, on, when the red line opened on day one, they were on that train in 1976. And one woman was on in 1977 on the blue line, um, and they were on this silver line train. So, and one of them had their old pennant from the red line. So, so it, it is. It, I think it shows you how meaningful Metro is to the community, and and how we serve, and also why it's important that we perform so well uh, for this community. So, you know that love hate relationship, right? People love Metro. And the hate is when we're not doing to the level they expect. So, uh, you know, today that was a big, big celebration. So a great picture to start off that. Uh, we also uh, had uh, 7,820 people, I'm told, on day one at the six new stations. So, uh, and that, you know, that's actually a lot of people considering it was also a horrible weather day, right? Uh, we're, we're not uh, exactly in Minnesota here, so when it gets cold, people kind of, you know, are not overly happy. And it was, it was a rough kind of second half of that day. So trains were busy. I know people were lining up as soon as we went on the system. So that, that is that connection we're, we're excited to, to, to show. So we have another fun uh, little, uh, a little shorter video, but another fun little video to play here on the Silver Line as well. of the board and Metro staff, I want to welcome you here today. For me, today is also most important, uh, really most importantly, because of the reason we really exist at Metro, and that's about serving our customers. Our future is very bright, but against the backdrop of this great November day, I think the Silver Line helps make it even brighter. When the airport was first opened almost exactly 60 years ago today, President Kennedy said that the building symbolizes the aspirations of the United States. And I think the same can be said of the Silver Line today. One, two, three, Silver!
So, so we're very excited about that. So as the chair said, let's get out, ride silver, uh, and uh, enjoy all of our new stations. Uh, next up, we're, let's talk quickly about better bus because I mentioned right from the start, uh, rail and bus customers are equal and we gotta make sure our bus system is performing. Um, you know, we talk a lot about rail right now. Obviously, when we got here, when I got here, 7,000 series was a big issue. We're working through that. Silver Line was an issue. We're, uh, you know, successful launch uh, this week. Potomac Yards we've been talking about, lots of other big capital programs on rail. But on the bus side, our bus network redesign is a gigantic opportunity for this agency to help move this region forward. Uh, the bus is the backbone of our regional transportation system. So uh, a lot of you uh, had the opportunity to be involved in, in actually the launch of the, on the Better Bus uh, Network um, uh, project down at Anacostia Station. Thank you for that. And then some people have been out at other events. So just want to give the board a quick update. We've had over 12,000 interactions with customers and 5,300 surveys have been completed. That's a lot of engagement. Uh, we are going to where people are versus people coming to us, and that is the right way to do engagement in 2022. Uh, you know, we're certainly not done with the engagement process. The, the survey has, has been completed. So now what's gonna happen over the next few months, every piece of that data is gonna get analyzed. We're gonna be working on you know, future bus network options, and then in the spring, we're gonna take those options uh, kind of publicly and then return to the region for another round of outreach. So it's a very iterative process, but this is a big, you know, really big effort for us. It's critical and I, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but Metro Bus's 50th anniversary is in early 2023. We're going to celebrate that, but it's about that rebirth of what, of what the bus can be uh, for all of our customers. I think the other day we had 330,000 people on bus, um, you know, I, I think there's ways that we can move our bus system forward to be cover, uh, cover, uh, carrying even a lot more people than that, providing that safe, frequent, reliable service that people need. So just thanks to the uh, Better Bus team, they're working very hard, and I want to give make sure the board had an update on that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, fair, fair, uh, fair evasion has obviously been one of those uh, top topics we, we hear a lot from our customers and, and from stakeholders and from staff. So we've been doing a lot of that. As I mentioned at the last board meeting, uh, we have our ticketing in place with our transit police officers. They've been doing a, a really uh, great job at that. We, and I think that shows by the interactions we've been having with our customers. Uh, you know, we made sure that students that should be actually kids ride free program anyway, that might not have a card. We're making sure they get in and out of the, of the system safely. Uh, and there's no issues with that. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that people uh, uh, had the ability to pay, but we're not paying and we needed to cut down on that. So we've had police officers out. I think we've issued officially, I think it's 35 citations, um, but I'll double check that. I think it's 35. And our, but we've had hundreds of people that have we either quote unquote left a station or what the police would refer to as readjusted behavior. And that's a nice way of saying they decided to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and because the presence is there to say you're walking through and they see the police and they either go to a fare machine or they take, or, or after they've been, they evade, the police say, hey, please, you have to go out. And each jurisdiction is different, unfortunately, because we don't have a metro you know, tariff policy uh, at this moment across all the jurisdictions, so it's a little different. But overall, it's going really well. Uh, again, we're trying to do this in the most humane. Uh, we're trying to avoid confrontation, but we have rules, and the rules have to be followed in the system. And so I really appreciate the chief's leadership. He's out there personally at a lot of these uh, details. And uh, we, you know, sometimes there were a lot of officers out there. We did that initially. The more officers actually reduces the chance of confrontation and force. And that was kind of the purpose of that, very visual. And then that'll be scaled down to be appropriate a, a, as the program evolves. So that was one element. The second part is some physical alterations to the gates. And I know there's been a lot of conversation about the gates. Why not this and how about that? Um, you know, uh, this is the gate system you know, we currently have. And, and other gate systems may do things that prevent people from jumping, but they actually may encourage people to do piggybacking. And so there is never a perfect gate. If we want to have a gate that there will never be fair evasion, it's called a wall and we won't run service, right? So the idea is how do we make the system as fair as possible, try to actually not have people do fair evasion at the same time, uh, you know, be realistic that we are a transit system. So uh, over here, you have a typical fair gate on the left. For most people, uh, to get over that gate, if you're not gonna pay a fare, you use the sides to kind of, if you will, jump or balance yourself to get over that gate. 
on the, uh, the ADA gates were actually even lower than our regular gates. So a lot of uh, data at the start showed that those, those gates were even getting the most amount of, of fare evasion because they're easier to get over. So the two prototype uh, fare modifications that we've made, and again, we rolled, we rolled these out at Fort Totten today, and the idea is to get uh, a couple more places, but really we're looking for feedback and data and to see what these actually uh, result in. This isn't to say this is the final end state. You know, we need to be a learning organization, acknowledge where we're doing something well, where we're not, modify, keep moving forward. On the left is at one of the ADA gates, and you'll look and see the, the, the different type of paddle. So it's a much higher gate, but it, it kind of goes in and out, rotates like a, what we would call a saloon door. Now, that type of gate could lead to, in theory, a little bit more piggybacking, what we would call piggybacking, as in someone pays, someone trails behind them. With that said, it's very, very difficult to jump over that gate. And that's not to say someone couldn't physically, but that, that cuts down the, that significantly. That type of modification is, is fairly expensive because it changes the entire design and the gate motor system. So a lot of times people see the stainless steel boxes on the two sides and think that's the gate. There's all the mechanics and the, and the electronics inside. So that is one area we're looking. The second on the right is what we are calling, I guess for lack of better, blades uh, internally. And the idea there is to have, have, a, have a physical spot that you are not able to put your hands to go across the gate. So the team has actually worked extensively on, on the right. There's a lot of ideas. Someone would say, well, what about this? Well, that could lead to something else. So A, we want to make it so whatever we put on there didn't cause a, a potential safety hazard. Two, we can't collect trash and debris and other things of that nature. So, and it couldn't obviously you know, protrude into the gate itself because that could be an ADA or catch our safety issue by catching someone's bag or coat or whatnot. So um, there's lots of ideas on Twitter about this, but I will say the team has done a lot of great engineering work. We're gonna now uh, watch and see the results of, uh, of these and move forward. But I wanted to you know, show these today. I know the board has been very interested in this topic, and I hope you'll see that the staff is really trying to move this topic along in an iterative way to, to, make, to make gains. Uh, lastly, uh, I want to show Columbia Heights. So as Andy mentioned when he was up here on the capital program, one of the things I think most people in the area always would like is, what does the service look like before I go down a, a long escalator to get downstairs? So uh, really proud of Brian Anderson and, and, and a lot of the team. They put one of these signs out uh, pretty soon after I got here at Metro Center. This is another one at Columbia Heights. Right now that is showing rail, but the idea is rail and bus, the whole information suite that's gonna be around Columbia Heights. But it gives people that sense of what's really going on in the system. We'll be over time, we can modify those things with upcoming closures or shutdowns or public service announcements. But those screens are gonna come in very handy and we wanna obviously get those all around the system. On the right is another thing we were working on. And in a lot of places, uh, let's say you walk into a Target. And if you walk into a Target, you're gonna see yourself on TV. And it just says, if you see us, we see you, that kind of thing, right? It's very common in almost every retail establishment most of us have ever walked in. And uh, uh, I actually did this at another transit property and, and it's kind of becoming more standard in our industry. But we were installing screens like that. So if you walk into our station, you are gonna see yourself on the screen and you'll see the little message there. I think it says smile, you're on MetroCam. And the idea we wanna be very clear, 99.9% .9 of our customers are amazing people that we need to serve on a daily basis. There are a few people, because we are, in a we are part of a larger society, that uh, either are purposely or end up committing you know, crimes. We wanna make it very clear to someone, if you come on our system, you are going to be seen. Transit police will use that video and we will go out and, and find you and hold you accountable for crimes committed on our system. And that is all in on we need to be a very safe system for our, for our customers and for our staff. And that's another message to say, we have a lot of video out here. Please be on the community. It's a community asset. Treat your community system with respect. Otherwise, you will be caught. So please do not commit criminal acts on our system. So this is, again, using technology to help, our, uh, help uh, really move the system along. Uh, last but not least, I just want to, again, just say thank you to uh, the staff, um, uh, the, you know, the board. Thank you for, for being at the event and all of your uh, leadership and support is really appreciated. And to the staff, um, you've been being pushed really, really hard. Uh, 
myself, including on the push. Um, but we are coming back here at Metro, and I hope people feel that, that excitement and that energy. Ridership is coming back. Uh, we're opening things. We're moving technology. Um, our police deployments, uh, how, how we're thinking about bus, bus lane enforcement, all of these types of things. We, are, we have a lot cooking, and the team is working incredibly hard for the community, and I just want to thank them and wish you all a, a happy Thanksgiving, uh, and I hope you get a few moments of rest and relaxation. And then we're going to be right back at it, uh, serving the community. So with that, Chair, that's, those are my remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Randy. Any questions for the general manager? Sure. Comments? Ms. Klein. Um, I just want a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I want to say I was skeptical of that silver ticket idea when I first heard it. It had a little bit of a Willy Wonka vibe. I wasn't sure. But I actually had the opportunity to ride on that train um, with the silver ticket holders. I have to say, the excitement on that train was potentially even more than at the event in the morning. I, I had never seen so many folks so happy to be on a metro train. It was fabulous. So great work to whoever's idea that was, and the execution seemed terrific as well. Um, I also want to say, you know, I want to note, we've had all these, some big celebrations, fantastic culmination of decades of work. Um, but I think it's also important to highlight, we didn't make a video about the roadway worker protection uh, changes and work that's going on there, but I think that's just, you know, just as important for folks to understand that those types of internal efforts are going on as well, even if they're not getting as much sort of public attention. And I just want to, you know, make sure that, that, that that's clear, that those things are happening at the same time that we're having the really public events. Um, and then just one question. The... Um, mitigations that you're testing for the gates, are those in use in other systems or are WMATA's bear gates so different that these are sort of prototypes that are unique to, to us? Yeah, great question, board member. So I would say the one on the left is pretty similar to some other systems you may see in the country or around the world. I mean, the reality is they're all present transit. We do nothing the same. It's part of our own problem as an industry, uh, quite frankly. but. Um, but I would say the one on the left is similar to stuff I've seen in, uh, in other places. Sometimes they are shaped a little differently, sometimes higher, sometimes different materials, but that. Uh, the one on the right, I've seen versions of things that would maybe, again, uh, prevent someone from easily jumping. But th this is kind of a modification that the gate manufacturer and our engineering uh, team work through um, because we have you know, our, our issue is our, if you look at our gate array right now, it looks beautiful, right? So we might have more, in a way, maybe we've, the balance is one step more beautiful than function, and this is kind of to bring that function maybe up there, because, you know, we also don't want to lose all the data. So we have all these sensors and electronics in there, and then they also have uh, wh where the lights are. So th the design is very complex to not lose all, the features and the other safety features inside of the gate. So hopefully this will actually make a, uh, make a difference. And uh, the team also has some other ideas. Uh, but, but we're hoping that, the, the, you know, this will, this will at least mitigate uh, some fare evasion. And just to follow up, the, what is the timing of when the test kind of will be completed and expect to come back with that? Video? Yeah, I, I, uh, Tom's leading this for us, so we have a little bit more work to actually define uh, that. I mean, th this has been an all-out kind of rush in some ways to, to get these installed. Uh, and remember, we will never, it's not a ex perfect experiment because at one moment, ridership's coming back. Another moment over here, we're doing ticketing and fare enforcement that we haven't done in, I guess, over three years. Then we have these gate modifications. Then we have the security screen. So there's a lot, it's pretty, gonna be very hard to isolate a variable, but we also have the granularity to know per gate when sensors go off, stations. So Tom's working through the idea of a dashboard that would show where we have the most fare evasion and where we don't. And again, I think you know publicly, we gotta be honest of where we're getting more fare evasion and less, and then be deep, very data driven on where we do things. Dr. Lowe. Yeah, I mean, look, everybody wants this to be data-driven, so I think that this is the right way to think about this. Um, I'd like to go to Fort Totten to check these out, so, I mean, I can absolutely do that on my own time, but if anyone wants to come with me, uh, I'm thinking of, like, a little weekend field trip um, out there to just try these out, see see what's what. Really appreciate, I can 
completely wrap my head around this. Must have been an enormous amount of time and like a huge sprint to pull this off. Um, yeah, so I just I just want to check it out. Um, I think that uh, in the big picture, you know, Randy, things are really moving in the right direction, and I just want to I want to thank you for how how great your first few months have been. I feel um, that a lot of issues that people have been raising about WMATA for a long time, I think I feel I feel like you're hearing them and you're acting on them, and that's. That's what people want. So thank you. Very kind of you. Thank you. It's just the, the team. I'm, I'm just a member of the team. So thank you. And uh, I know if you, if you want someone to join you for a field trip, we're happy to go out there. I guess we'd only ask that you don't, don't try to jump over that thing and hurt yourself. Yeah. So uh, that'd be my only ask. <laughs> and are we taking the Accessibility Advisory Committee on a little field trip to try these yeah. out? Right? Because uh, yeah. you know, if, we're if we're working with the accessible gate in particular, yeah. um, you know that we nothing should happen without their buy-in. That's been part of the process. Great. So obviously more to, more to do, right? Like it's everything's iterative, and the idea is to uh, isolate. Uh, fair, uh, Fort Tom was specifically unique here because there was an area where there was no gates in this one section, and that's why that per, that area was was put in there purposeful to see how that would interact before doing some other deployments. So, Deputy Mayor Babers. Um, yes, thank you. I probably have more of a comment. So we are 17 days into enforcement for fair evasion. And you have indicated that you estimated only about 35 tickets have been issued. And I assume no arrests. Uh, there was an arrest during a fair evasion um, deployment, but that arrest was not related to fair evasion. Okay, great. So, you know, when we first started talking about this, many in D.C. was like, OMG, fair evasion. They're going to arrest all the children and everybody else. And, you know, I want to give kudos to the chief and his team because clearly they are doing a great job, doing this with compassion, understanding, and giving opportunities for people to um, realize that they really weren't trying to fair evade. They just forgot to pay. And they make that right, and so, and so, incredible job. Um, and I actually have to reduce the number of additional ticket books that we need to get for you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess a couple of them. Well, thank you for recognizing the the hard work of uh, you know the, the the chief and the department. Uh, Patty and the legal team were heavily involved, and others as well. And we are trying to do it in a compassionate way at the same time, enforcing rules. Right? Um, the the each jurisdiction is a little different, so. Uh, if it's in Virginia or Maryland, the citation kind of gets done. I mean, my understanding, and I'll double check with the chief, I don't think we have had one citation in D.C. Because the way it's written in D.C. doesn't really allow us to do a citation without also arresting someone for trespassing. So the basic way it works in D.C., someone jumps or, or, or goes through a gate, they're told, hey, you got to go out and pay, and the and way it's been working, they all leave. So they either self-correct or they leave. The way it would work under D.C. law is if they refuse to leave, then they get ticketed, and then they're going to get arrested for trespassing. Where in Maryland and Virginia, if you fare evade and the officer is on the other side of the gate, you're just going to get ticketed for fare evasion. So that's, kind of, quite frankly, one of the challenges that we have is we're back into the compact has determined how we do everything, regardless if it's the right or wrong thing to run a transit agency, uh, because because of the funding model. So one of the things that we want to actually have a discussion in 23 with the board is kind of creating maybe what metro tariff policy should look like and not being, I mean, we have a police officer out there with three different ticket books. That's, I think we shall, that's, a, that's not normal. And so how do we work through those types of things over time? But yeah, I thank you for recognizing the chief. I mean, they, they're, they're doing this really well and we want the community to understand we're, we're, we are community focused on doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, next, we'll move on to the reports of the jurisdictions, NBTC. I don't have anything, uh, Mr. Letourneau. No, I just wanted to, since we were doing a whole uh, Silver Line discussion, not to beat a dead horse, but I just wanted to also thank the jurisdictional partners, the Fairfax and Loudoun County staff and the MWA staff that worked on this for a long time. And they worked really well with Metro um, as well. And uh, 
Also on the public affairs side, more recently, uh, there's been a lot of teamwork and communication between Metro and the jurisdictional staff. And quite frankly, that's something that we have heard criticism about in the past, maybe not occurring as much as it should. And um, that definitely was not the case this time. So uh, I just wanted to specifically mention that. As far as METC business itself, uh, nothing nothing urgent to report. Yes, thank you. Deputy Mayor Babers for the district. Nothing to report. Uh, WSTC. Uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, federal government, Ms. Klein. Yeah, well, as was noted at the event on Tuesday, this week marks the one year anniversary of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I just thought that that was worth noting as that is providing significant resources, not just to WMATA, but to all transit agencies around the country, um, as well as many opportunities for um, competitive grants. And I know we had a discussion earlier today about the variety of grants available. Um, don't worry, this was not the only time those grants are going to be available. They will be offered for the next four years at least. At least that's the plan. So there should be multiple opportunities for WMATA to make use of those, um, and I, I hope that we do. And there are a wide variety of opportunities and all sorts of uh, ways beyond electrification, which is what we were talking about today. Um, but there are many, many opportunities, and it's, uh, it's just very exciting that that year has, uh, has passed so quickly. And I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Martin Proctor as well. Hi, thank you so much, Director Klein. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, as our federal partners, we would like to recognize just on behalf of the White House that it is Native American Heritage Month. Um, this November 2022, that the White House put out a um, proclamation and that all of our agencies across the federal government, Department of Transportation, are working diligently to recognize the past and present of our indigenous tribes here in America and the United States. In particular, with regards to transportation, working diligently with regards to improving overall infrastructure, because we understand that transportation is a foundation for economic development and improved living. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with no further business to come before the board, we will stand adjourned. Now I'll read a request for executive session in accordance with the bylaws. I, Paul Smedberg, request that the board of directors convene an executive session to discuss the following matters pursuant to Article 2, Paragraph 9, subsections uh, A, I guess here, budgetary matters that may affect uh, legal positions, WMATA contracts, or sensitive relationships with local jurisdictions or the federal government, and C, uh, personal or labor issues, including discussions of labor contracts and labor negotiations, consideration of interviews of candidates for employment, and the assignment, uh, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, or resignation of individuals, H, development of WMATA position or strategy on pending or proposed federal or state legislation. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. Lowe. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You guys have it. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and if I could...